the anointed ministry of ministry, Gloria Harvest. You couldn't do that just a few, a few hours ago. Can you give God glory for our kids? Glory to God. Thank you, Minister Father. God will. Listen, church, if you have your Bible, take that sword of the Spirit in your hand and say, my church. This is how we like to receive the word of God. You know how we do it. Lift it up to heaven. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord God. Okay. I receive your word. It is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Teach me your ways, O oh God. And I will never be the same. Right. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 52. Luke's Gospel chapter 2, verse 52. All of our friends, visitors, today, welcome and God bless you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. This is my first time back speaking publicly. Give God the glory to help us. Today I want to talk to families today. There you will find these words. Word of God says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Once again, Jesus grew from the NIV translation, grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. A lot of people forget that Jesus came from a family, that he had his own kinfolk that he grew up with. I want to speak to the family today from the scripture. And I want to, I want to talk to you about five thoughts for the family. Five thoughts. Praise the Lord. Precious people of God, Awesome families grow. Awesome families grow. In fact, when you have healthy relationships in your family units, it encourages growth. You look back over the years and you start looking at your kids and you look at your spouse and you begin to say, wow, look at how God can keep us. Look at what God has done. 
You remember when they were first born, when you first brought them home? You remember when you were just, as they used to say, knee high to a grasshopper, and your grandparents looked at you and said some kind words to you. They spoke into your life. You remember growing up in your own family, your own homes, and that familial context was so vital to your development and your growth that we we cannot underestimate the fact that God uses families. Generation, strong families make strong churches. Let me say it again. The, strong, er, the stronger your family is, the stronger the Lord's church will be. Because God operates in family units. And in families, everybody ought to be growing. One of the things that families are so, so anointedly put together by the Lord, you know, God has a big family. <laughs> and one of the things that God has anointed the family unit to do is that the family creates an atmosphere of learning. As a matter of fact, it creates atmospheres of lifelong learning. Because you didn't get to choose which family you were going to be in. Do I have a witness out there, somebody? And I know some of y'all were like, Lord, we could have switched out some of them other family members. But, but that, that's, enough, that's another sermon for another day. But, but, but you cannot pick and choose who God allowed you to call family. And the family that God has given you has taught you something. And when you think about this very critically and very carefully, beloved, families help each other to develop. A lot of what you took into your adulthood you got from your parents. Do I have a witness out there, somebody? The way you learned to cook, you got that from your grandma and your mom and all them. Come on, somebody. Then, and the way you clean your countertops and the way you organize your, 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 your you, you, when you look back over how you grew up, isn't it funny how God can use all that to form your, the habits that you still use today? God uses families. I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. And families encourage the discovery of individuals' gifts and talents and abilities. Families can allow for the people within them to learn new things, even to develop new interests. Never underestimate the power of a healthy family. And so I want to talk to you. I came to talk to you today because in my isolation, I was sort of cut off from my family. And um, even though, you know, my family was in the same house as me, it means something, the time that we spend together with our loved ones. And when that is taken away from you, you begin to become very introspective and reflective on just how God has anointed your family unit, no matter what the makeup of it is, to really bless your life, to really enhance your life. If you think about where you are today, as opposed to 20 years ago, you can look back over and see how God has used family to grow you up, to bless your life. I, I've got 15 people on this line right now who can lift holy hands, clap your hands and say, I thank God for my family. As, as crazy as we can be sometimes, Pastor, and, and sometimes we at each other's throat, and sometimes I don't want to deal with them sometimes. Thank God for my family. I know I've got a real person out there, people of God, but here's the deal. Dietrich, we don't necessarily get to choose our family, so we got to make it work with the family we got. And the thing about family is that Families change over the years. Somebody say families change. We stay the same, but yet we change, right? We evolve, we grow. And in the context of your family, when you look at it carefully, you have been developed and shaped by those in your unit. So, so, so that's family. But here's the thing I want you to also know about how God blesses family to bless you. You don't necessarily need just biological family to help you grow. Your church family could and should 
be a force of growth in your life. And I know I've got somebody on the line. You thank God for the church family that you call your family nowadays. Listen, we may not be perfect. We may not be mega. That don't even matter in COVID. That don't even matter no more. Everybody on the same level field. But I thank God just for good family members spiritually that I call my family. Generation, you are my family. And that means something. I've developed into the minister I am today because serving you has helped me grow up. If you look back over your life, my prayers that you have developed and grown since your time with being with generation. See, God uses families to develop you. And when you look at the text today, very simple, not going to be before you much longer, but here it is. Jesus had a family. Now, not just his heavenly fam family of the church of all ages and stages, not, not talking about the universal church and the global church, not talking about just that, but he had a human family, y'all. A lot of preachers don't preach on this kind of aspect. How many of y'all know Jesus had to grow up with kinfolk? He had folk down south. He had folk up in Bethlehem. He had folk, come on, talk to me, in Jerusalem. He had, he had family he visited. He had friends' house that he would, he would go over, Lazarus and them. He, would, he, he had familial connections. And when you study it carefully, Jesus, as a matter of fact, he comes from a huge family. I need some, I need some down home folk who you got a whole lot of kinfolk you came from. And, and you can start naming all of them. And, and you got cousins like, oh, I didn't even know you was my cousin. And they your cousin. Jesus had a big family, y'all. As a matter of fact, when you study his life, the Lord Jesus, of course, he had a human father who, of course, uh, received him as his own son. But his father's name was Joseph. You remember, of course, not only Joseph was his dad, but also he had a mom. Her name was what? Mary, right? Of course, Mary. But then you also look at it. Jesus had four brothers, y'all. Four brothers. Y'all remember, come on, my Bible scholars, James, Joseph, Simon, and the one called Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, but Judas. For my biblical scholars, he was later called Jude. This is where we get the book of Jude. And so when you read Jude and you read the book of James, you're reading the books of Jesus' brothers. Lord have mercy. Teach, Pastor Fryson. I'm going to do the best I can. So he had four brothers. Now, y'all, if you have it now, for those of you who grew up and you had brothers, you know how that's like. Y'all know the fist fights y'all got in. You know the wrestling matches you got in. Come on, talk to me, family. But not only that, but he also had two, at least two sisters. Two sisters. So, so y'all, that's eight people in Jesus' immediate family. Not, to, not even including his auntie. Her name was Salome. She was the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary. And then Jesus had an uncle. His name was Zebedee. Come on, teach somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Zebedee was his uncle. So, so when you start looking at the immediate family and then you zoom out to the extended family, the Bible says in that context, watch this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. Our text today. Jesus, what? He grew in wisdom and stature. Could it be, Pastor Fryson, that God uses my family to help me to grow in wisdom and stature? Somebody ought to lift holy hands because the person you are today is because of some of those, those disciplines and those values you got from when you were growing up, the, the, the phobias you have today and the victories you do today and, and the way you talk today, the way y'all talk, you could still get around the dinner table and, and, and the husband come in and it sounds like y'all all arguing, but that's just the way your family talk. Y'all just talk, y'all ain't really arguing. That was just how y'all grew up. And, and then his family, they was, they was real quiet on their side of the family. And so, so when you get around his side of the family, they just, everybody's just eating their, their roast beef, eating their mashed potatoes and, and they quiet. But whatever, you are today, God used your family to grow you up. If Jesus 
humbled himself, watch this, so much to the point that the Bible says he had to learn to grow in wisdom and stature through his family. Then generation, what I'm trying to tell you in this second year of, of your up, ride with me, y'all. You need to be protecting your family relationships. Have you noticed, beloved, the enemy has tried your family? Oh, I can't get no help on this line today. I need some real people. When you look at it carefully, he's attacked your family. The enemy has attacked it with COVID. He's tried to attack with health issues. He's tried to attack with <laughs> every now and then disagreements. He's tried to attack with strife. And, and you look at the family unit and as crazy as our families get sometimes, that's what God's going to use to keep developing you. So I've come to speak just a word in due season. You heard what my minister said earlier. When she was going through the toughest times of her life, she was able to draw strength from family immediate and extended. It was her mother-in-law that fed her with the word of God, she said. It was her husband, I was there, I remember, who literally did not leave her side. It was her daughters that was praying and right there by her. Family makes all the difference in the world. And I'm here to tell you, no matter what they did to you, no matter the disagreement you've had with them lately, protect it, love them, and pray for your family. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I'm talking your family is a God's gift to you. So listen, there's five quick thoughts. Just And I'm done very quickly. Sean, I feel God on this. I did, did, there's five things I learned in isolation because I had a lot of time to myself just to kind of eat chips and take medicine and watch ESPN. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. But listen, I, I, I was I, the Lord was speaking to me during my time of isolation. You know, sometimes God got to get you by yourself for you to really listen. Lord have mercy. I don't know who that's for right there. If you're in a season of isolation, this is, I clap my hands, I celebrate you. This is one of the greatest seasons of your life. Get ready to hear what God's about to say. Listen, there are, there are five things that, that, that listen, that you're, you're never going to learn if you don't learn them in relationship with others. Family, context, right? You can't learn these necessarily at school. You can't learn these necessarily at work. You can only learn them with other people especially in the context of family community. Okay, now here it is. The first thing that I, I, I realized about what the family has done is that number one, you learn what to do with your feelings. In family, think about it. Think about it, y'all. You, you have learned how to handle your feelings in your family. See, what God does is in context of healthy families, now I ain't talking about dysfunctional stuff. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about healthy family relationship, right? You learn how to identify how you're feeling. You learn how to own up to your feelings. You get to learn in your families how to, how to deal with how you feel. Awesome families, awesome families, listen, they always let everybody be honest and open. Generation, what I'm asking you to do is never try to shut your family up. Let people express their feelings in family. If you have your own family, you have children, you have kids, listen, let the kids express their emotions too. Listen, I can't preach nothing I ain't gone through. Listen, y'all, I'm a living witness, no matter what, because as they're getting older, as they're growing up, the, you, the, your family is the place where they learn how to deal with how they feel about stuff. They're confused about some stuff. They're inquisitive about some stuff. And God uses you and your wife and your, your husband and uses that context of family to really help them deal with how you, how you feeling about that. I don't know, Ma. I feel some kind of way about that. Whenever they say stuff like that, 
It's a sign God is working. Lord have mercy. Who is this word for today? God, he, he works through the family. But but Ma, I, I'm 27 years old. I'm still your mother. Listen, let them deal with their feelings. And God does it in context. Jesus had to learn how to deal with how he felt through his family. So check this out. Back row, ride with me. About time Jesus had to deal with Pharisees and Sadducees, folk who were trying to do him in, had to deal with people who were trying to catch him and manipulate him. And about time he got to deal with a best friend who had passed away, his name was Lazarus. And about time he had to deal with brothers, quote unquote brothers, who fell asleep on him while he was trying to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he felt some kind of way about that. Do you know he didn't just get to that point to be able to deal with that? He had been dealing with it since he was a child. He dealt with it and learned how to handle his feelings, ride with me, y'all, in his family. See, we don't know exactly everything that happened from the ages of 12 to 30, but we do know the Bible says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and statue. Can I teach this thing, y'all? Listen, tell somebody, throw it in the chat box for me right quick. Say, you need to learn how to deal with your feelings. Just tell them you need to learn how to, and the family is with, listen, my family just had a powwow just yesterday. Lord have mercy. I'm so thankful we're doing better today because people look at pastors and stuff and they think we ain't real people. Think we ain't got family drama and issues and stuff. Like, let me tell you something. We had to make up last night. I had the people crying, snotting, all kinds of stuff. Listen, I, I, look, if Jesus had to go through that, I got to go through that. If I got to go through that, y'all sure enough know you got to go through that. Uh, uh, kids coming to adulthood, kids coming into puberty, kids, newborns, and you can't get no sleep. Whatever it is, learn how to deal with your feelings. That's what God blesses in family. Number two, God uses the family, watch this, y'all, to learn how to handle conflict. God will use your family. I, I need some real witnesses. I need some hand clappers right there. To, he'll teach you how to deal with conflict, Lord have mercy, in the context of family. Now, you could, you could go out a little. You can, you can go to your extended kinfolk on this one. It ain't all, the conflict ain't always in your house. Sometimes it's in your extended family. Preach, Pastor Fryson, I'm gonna do the best I can. Listen, y'all, ain't nothing like family to drive you crazy. Lord have mercy. That's really what I'm trying to say. I need some help in this place. Here it is. And, and, and God, let it be like that. He just, he just let it be like that because you've got to learn how to, see, if you're going to enjoy life, you got to learn how to handle conflict. And God will use the family to do that. I can't stand them, Pastor. We ain't talking no more. You all going to talk. Just give it like two hours, and then y'all going to come back, get some burritos, get some fajitas, and just get some ice cream, call tonight, watch a movie. Y'all going to be good. You know, Because God uses families to get on your nerve. You got to learn how to handle conflict. Boy, Pastor G, they don't preach like this no more. See, here's what you... here's. Here's your tweetable for the day. Here's your tweetable. Kids need to see their parents working out problems if they're going to learn how to work out problems. Thank you for the five people who clapped their hands right there because I know generation, we so blessed and so anointed. You know, Sean, since you left and came back, man, listen, man, we, we never had no problems in our families. Generation's just clear. We, we, we don't ever have drama. Behind the scenes, man, nobody is arguing. Nobody having nothing. But let me tell you something. Generation, the kids need to see how you guys work the problems out. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Work it out in front of them. Work it out in front of them. What do you mean, Pastor? You can't work all your problems out behind the scenes because they'll never learn how to deal with conflict. Parents. Here's, here's your excuse for the day. Next time y'all have a disagreement, make sure when y'all come back together, do it in front of the kids. Let the kids see how you handle conflict because that is what's going to help. Watch this. 
grow them up in wisdom and stature. You can't, kids, go to your rooms, me and your father talking. No, no, no. Sometimes you got to do it right in the living room and let the children see how you result. Boy, I am preaching. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Thank God for three people nodding your head. Listen, I'm telling you, Jesus had a family. He had four brothers alone. Y'all know they were doing some WWE stuff and doing some, somebody was coming off the top turnbuckle. Somebody was doing the figure four leg lock. Somebody, would, come on, somebody, somebody was biting somebody. Ma Mary, Mom, Mary, let me tell you what Jesus did. Can you imagine the conflicts was in Jesus' house? Or, or you just thought that it was just, dun, dun, dun. someone say they were human. They were human, right? Come on, church. They were what? They were human. So you read a scripture like Luke 2, 52, that he grew in wisdom. That's what God is doing with you. He uses the conflicts to develop you. So don't be afraid to work it out in front of the children. Number three, number three, here it is. You learn how to handle loss in your families. Here's what I realized. And before y'all, you know, we go to the extreme, of course, loss can be the loss of life. Of course, that is something we learn in our families. But, and, and that's really one of those lessons that you just continue to try to, you know, manage and deal with, right? But in families, it's not always the loss of life. Sometimes it's the loss of energy. Sometimes it's the loss of some time. You could lose a job. You could you know, lose some friends along the way. How many of you can be a witness? Lift holy hands, right? You had to learn how to handle loss. Your family has been right there with you, noting how you dealt with it, knowing how you overcame it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to say something before I leave you today that's going to shock you. But let me put it very plainly. Here it is, y'all. Y'all ready for this? You don't want your kids to win all the time. Thank you for the two people clap their hands. Let, let me say it again for the middle row, because I know what you're saying. And before you, before you try to vote me out the church, listen, I'm here to tell you, you don't want the kids to win all the time. All the time, Pastor? I mean, how will they learn how to handle loss? See, here's what I discovered in the family unit. See, my wife will tell you, when, when I was kind of down for just a little bit, recovering and all that, they lost some time with me. They lost some interaction with me. And so they had to learn how to deal with that loss because nobody was there to talk about the Ravens. Nobody was there to watch sports. Nobody was there to get on the grill and cook some chicken. Nobody was there to cut the grass. Nobody was there. My boys had to realize, oh, we got to take the trash out. Come on, somebody, how many of y'all know you got to learn how to handle loss? Like, it, it, it can happen in any kind of way. So in the family unit, the, the kids grow up and they move out and they start, Deacon Elizabeth, they, they get their own jobs and they, and they start life and stuff. And you you left there like, oh, oh my baby, you know, and, and, and you and you still learning how to handle loss. So loss isn't just the loss of life. Sometimes it's just the loss of the way things used to be. Church, we lost the way we used to be. It was called COVID-19. And we lost how we used to come together. And guess what? As a family, Lord, help me preach. We learned how to deal with it. We learned how to handle it. Come on, somebody. We were in this together. You kept showing up. You, you still showing up, coming on Zoom. Y'all know you didn't know nothing about Zoom before 2019. You didn't know how to log into Zoom. You didn't know nothing about, come, we were still doing conference calls. That was our virtual experience. Now look at you, you're a Zoom expert. Because of loss, families learn how to deal with it. So you don't want the kids to win all the time. Parents, I'm gonna say something again, please don't hate me, but here's what I learned to do. I had to let my kids fail sometimes. I need a real, per real parent right there. Let them fail sometimes. Now, here's what you do. You know, you know, Minister Harvey, you always in the corner just in case the thing get out of control and you got to jump in there. You, you, you're, you're always watching. I, I ain't saying abandon them, right with me, y'all. But what I am saying is, how will they learn 
how to overcome stuff in life. If you rescuing them all the time, preach, Pastor Freyson. I'm going to preach this anyhow. One of the biggest things as parents that we can do to mess our kids up is to not teach them how to handle loss. You've got to let them go in there and with their mixed feelings, say, you got to go back to school tomorrow. You got to handle, you got to go work. You need this money. You got to do, now I'm going to be here when you get home. We'll talk about it, but you've got to let them handle it. Every, my, my daughter told me the other day, she said, daddy, let me mess up. I said, you got it. You got it. You got it. Because in just a minute, daddy ain't going to be around the corner. You're going to have to talk to the professor. You're going to have to pay the bill. That's why I gave you a credit card. That's why you got a debit card. You, you're going to have to go to the bursar's office. I'll take care of it at, later. But y'all feel what I'm saying? But you've got to let them develop. My son is the way he is now because he had to go on his own. Your children have, are growing up and developing families and stuff. They had to learn how to overcome some stuff, some whoopsie moments and some oops moments. Let them lose every now and then. Don't rescue them all the time. That's what's wrong with people at Christmas time, giving the children everything they want. Every time, I'm going to preach this anyhow. Stop giving them everything they ask for every time. No, I give you, I'll give you the iPad, but you're not getting a new TV. Yes, I give you a new TV, but I, you, we ain't giving you a new car. You're going to have to earn that. It's whatever it is, let them lose some things so they know. Because life, I need some people. How many of you know life will give you some L's sometimes? So it's in the family context. If you rescuing them all the time, no wonder we have a society of children spoiled and just underdeveloped because they don't, and they can't, some of them can't deal with loss. They can't deal with stuff, people talking about them. They can't deal with a little conflict because, because folk are rescuing them all the time. Let the, listen, counsel them through some stuff. I'm gonna leave it alone. I learned this. Y'all ain't ready for me. I need some thank you for the five folk. May God give you a, a boost of credit score by next Thursday. Thank you for the praise you gave God right there because you know I'm right about it. You know you got to be real careful about spoiling them. Here it is. If we rescue them all the time out of everything, they'll find it devastating when they, when they face the losses of life in their adulthood. People of God, they need to learn that failure, here it is, won't destroy them. Can I give you the, another tweetable? Someone say, failure won't destroy you. And as a, I've got some adults on this line, I've got some youth on this line, you have already learned failure didn't destroy you. As a matter of fact, it probably motivated you. As a matter of fact, it probably caused you to change some stuff. You, you live in where you live right now because you got tired of the way things used to be. You got your own stuff the way you got it because you were tired of, okay, I've got a witness out there. And so we have to teach our children loss isn't the end of life. Two more, I'm done. I'm done real quick. Oh, Pastor G, I'm trying not to preach. Here it is. Here it is. Families, and this is what I believe Jesus learned too. G families help you to learn which values matter most. Families help you to learn which values matter most. I can only imagine that in Jesus' family, yes, he's God, don't get me wrong. He is the son of God, God the son. But the Bible says that he humbled himself so much, watch this y'all, that he allowed himself to have to learn to do well. Come on somebody, he had to learn some stuff. He had to grow. He, he humbled himself to the human experience so low that he had to be taught values. Lord have mercy. That's why I'm asking you to safeguard your family. No matter what stage or phase your family's in, no matter where you are right now as a family unit, listen, Continue to develop those values and teach what the values matter most. Some of you, you grew up and you value a clean kitchen. You, you, you just value a clean kitchen. You can't stand no dirty, nasty, 
roach crawling all over the sugar container kitchen. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You ever been over somebody's house, Sean, and, 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 and you just see, you see one of them little buggers in the corner and you're like, oh, Jesus, oh, Lord. And then here they go talking about the macaroni and cheese is ready. And you're like, no, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. They talking about the roasted chicken is ready, roasted potatoes. And, and, and you seeing crumbs all over the, the island and stuff. Like, you know, you don't like that because you got that value from your parents and they got it from their parents. And if you, whenever you went over your grandparents' house, if things were kept a certain way, your, your mom and daddy did it a certain way and you still do it. Y'all still get off the phone when it's storming outside. You, you're like, Lord, it's raining outside. Let me get off this phone. You do not get in the bathtub because it's storming outside. You, you whatever the value is, you got it. You got it from your family. Talk to me, somebody. I'm done. So, so here's what you need to understand. For your children, you know, the world will try to teach them basically the three temptations of life. But, you know, those temptations that try to tell them this is what you ought to value. This is how it ought to look. They look, they look at BET and they look at somebody shaking it, dropping it like it's hot, letting it down like it's warm. Talk to me, somebody. They, they look at... <laughs> They think you got to have your nails a certain way. You got you to put on something over here and take from this section and put it on that section. And, th and they say that's a value. And, and they're looking at this stuff. And they're like, that's what I got to be. I gotta, I'm the queen bee. I got to be, I got to be that. I, and the, and the, re the reality is those temptations you have to deal with in the family. Because in other words, sex, salary, and status is what the devil is trying to get your kids to love. Sex, se oh boy, I'm, oh God. I, see, this is, re this is retreat stuff. I wish I could pull y'all on a retreat and really talk to the family. But the devil is, is trying to get them to be oversexed. And if you can get a good salary, you get money. Yeah, go make that paper. And then the last thing, oh, get status. You be the man, you be the man. These, my friends, be careful. Thank you, Jesus, are the three temptations of life. So you got to protect them against that. You got you to gotta establish the value. It ain't about sex like that. You wait until you're married in the context of holy matrimony. And even if you only start off making 20000 a year, if you make it honestly, you have a good work ethic. You got to teach them. It's about hard work. It's about going back and doing your very best every chance you get. And then you teach them, it's not about your status in life. I don't care if you're still living at home. Listen, eventually, eventually God's gonna bless you to have your own house. So don't let the status of, I, I had to be delivered from that as a preacher a long time ago. Your church is small, doc. Your church is small. The heck with your opinion. It's about being a church. It's about being a people. I knew there was people that were gonna be depending on this ministry somewhere down the line, Sean, and we had to stick with it. We had to stay with it. And look at us today. Everybody ain't even on this line. I promise you. But we're here because we have values. And the last thing is this, beloved, and I bid you a good day in the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope this is helping somebody. I believe Jesus had to learn in his family, just like we do, that you learn good habits from your family. Sometimes you can learn some of them bad ones too, but we learn good habits from the family. One of the things I love is when I see parents instilling, instilling in their children things like reading. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Being readers. Leaders are readers. And readers lead, you know. Values like getting a good night's sleep. Good habits like you're not going to have energy for work tomorrow if you don't get in bed by a certain time. Good habits. Am I preaching to anybody, y'all? Good habits, like just because you, you got a bonus on your job don't mean you spend it right away. Come on, good habits, somebody. Good habits, like at least once a year, you got to go for your checkup. Go to your doctor. Get a check. Somebody say good habits, good habits. Habits determine character. And I only, see, we know, I know Jesus was disciplined by his parents. Y'all remember that time he was lost in the temple? Well, they couldn't find him. And they thought he was lost, but he was in the temple teaching. 
the teachers. Y'all remember that? And, and he looked back at them and he said, we were looking for you all over the place. Where were you? And he looked back at them and said, did you not know I would be in my father's house? I know his parents' mind was blown right there. But, but, but he submitted to them, watch this, God submitted to them and went back home with his parents. He had to learn to grow up. So here's what I want to tell you, church. Families help each other to grow. Take the good of it, take the crazy of it, take the challenge of it, take the victories of it, but keep growing. These are five thoughts I have for the family. My prayer is that God will bless your family real good, that you will keep growing and keep going together. Never stop being the family God has been. And thank, if you've got a family that you're so thankful for today, won't you put your hands together? and bless the Lord and praise his holy name. Come off a of mute if you can for just a moment. Can we give God praise for the family immediate and extended? Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Yes, thank you. God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank God for your family, for your brothers, your sisters. If they're still here, thank you that you can call them up. And even though they get on your nerves sometimes, I know somebody, <laughs> you are, you are all, I, I almost call this all in the family, all in the family, because that's where we develop y'all. And Jesus, he grew in his large family. So keep growing. I want to pray for your families today before I let you go. And I bless and I pray that God blesses you real good. Come on, let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, thank you for establishing family. God, I ask a special blessing over the families of this great church. And even those who are watching on YouTube and Facebook, thank you for our extended family, guests, and friends. God, would you keep your hand upon our families that no, first of all, no hurt, harm, or danger will come upon our families. Thank you that you caused us to overcome every challenge the devil tried to throw at our family. Thank you, God, that you have been right there with us, giving us the victory, causing us to triumph. Thank you for blessing us with children, spouses, mother, father, Thank you, God, for just what you're doing. Now, God, I pray that in the second year of this, our declared year of up, that you would elevate our family, that you would take our families to another level. Let the love be at another level, hallelujah, in our family. Let joy and peace go to another level of reality in our family. God. Do it in the home first so that generation will be blessed when we come in. This is our prayer. And oh God, bless the children. Bless the parents. Bless the sisters and the brothers, aunties and uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, whatever the context. Thank you for loving our family. And God, we give you great praise that we're part of your big family. Thank you for adopting us. The Bible says, Lord, you said you have already accepted us in the beloved. You have adopted us by the spirit of ad adoption. So wherefore we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, in Jesus' name we love. Amen. Somebody, would you just bless the Lord? Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus for yourself, Maybe you're in YouTube, you're watching this. Listen, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to us. He will make, listen, he will make the difference in your life. Don't leave this service the same way you came. We want to offer Christ Jesus to you, my friend. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Fryson, I want to, I want to be saved. I don't know what all that means, but I know when I leave this earth, I want, I want to go to heaven. That means you need to be saved. That means you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
Bible is very clear. God sent, in the fullness of time, God sent his only begotten son that if you would just put your trust and faith in him, Bible says you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. The promise is Jesus paid it all for you, my friend. And so if you're listening to this and you're saying, Pastor Fryson, I want to be saved. All you need to do is make a decision right now. Come on, make a decision. I want Jesus as my savior. If you're ready to say and confess with your mouth, say this with me, Jesus, I need a savior. And I believe you died for my sins. Come on, confess this. I want you to save me. Say, come into my heart. I believe you now. Save me. In Jesus, your name I pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we believe God just saved you. He just honored you. Listen, somebody can be a witness. Is not God the best thing, the best person you've ever encountered in your life? Hallelujah. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to write me this week. Write me at this email address. Salvation at generationofpraise.org. It's in our chat box as well. Salvation at generationofpraise.org. We'll connect with you. We'll follow up with you. We'll get you acclimated where you need to be. Thank God for you. Come on, can we give God praise? Perhaps somebody just got 